When starting out in the video game industry, the small developer Intelligent Systems, formerly of Nintendo R&D One's fame, never assumed that they would reach the heights they've gained today. Starting off with a lone military strategy game that was deeply entrenched in another culture with modest sales to boot, it seemed like they would just have a small impact on the industry at large, but their second title, Fire Emblem, would change that. Braving new ground for the newly formed tactical RPG genre, the series would strive for its own innovations in story and gameplay. And while many Nintendo franchises sat on their laurels and waited for their next paycheck, each entry in this new series would try to improve on its predecessors while making their overall experience all their own. With improving sales and more gamers finding out about the franchise by the day, it seemed like there was nowhere to go but up for the franchise. But would its creator survive the transition? After the success of Fire Emblem Gaiden, Intelligent Systems finally felt it was time to move on from the Famicom to Nintendo's brand new Super Famicom. Having come out the same year as the original Fire Emblem, it was a surprise that the franchise was as much of a hit as it was, a testament to its quality in more ways than one. Since many people could have possibly missed out on the first entry, let alone the entire franchise itself, Intelligent Systems took the route that few developers take and decided to start from the ground up with a fresh take on their first outing. Fire Emblem, Mancho Nonazo, or Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem, releasing in 1994 was more of the same Fire Emblem fans had come to love, but with its own innovations. Mystery of the Emblem was a remake and a sequel in one package, splitting into books one and two. Each was developed with complete independence from one another, even featuring completely different soundtracks for each other. While the Super Famicom was, of course, a more powerful system, it still didn't have the power to feature basically two complete games on one cartridge, so cuts had to be made. Five complete chapters and six characters unfortunately had to be cut away to make room for book two. But that's not to say that the game was lacking for content, no, it was actually bursting from the seams with it. Book one followed Shadow Dragon's story to a T, with some exceptions of course. Book two on the other hand was a direct continuation of the story with characters new and old reuniting to slay a dragon and save the kingdom once again. Even though this entry compromised the original story, everything else within it made up for that. Graphics were significantly upgraded from their 8-bit counterparts, allowing units to differentiate themselves from one another more effectively. Gameplay, in the end, proved to be the most significant improvement of them all. Taking many of the ideas Fire Emblem Gaiden had created, Mystery of the Emblem added those and its own ideas into the mix. Colored tiles helped the player understand where and how each unit would move in battle. Each weapon was crafted to look vastly different from each other, adding even more personality into the story. Units that had a horse or pegasus were even able to dismount from their mounts, negating their weaknesses while creating new ones. The first implementation of the support system also made its way to this entry, in which units perform better in combat when they're near friends, family, or loved ones. Overall, battles were much faster and fancier than previous iterations, and it would only be improved on over time. Mystery of the emblem proved to be a fantastic leaping off point for the series, with its popularity growing faster by the day. After some time, it would actually become the most successful Fire Emblem game of all time in Japan, trouncing even modern entries by selling nearly 750,000 copies, a feat reserved for most mainstream Nintendo titles, a feat that Fire Emblem had earned. But before we could move on to the next entry, the series did what many other series have done, and created a few side projects. The first of these were manga adaptations of the series. Each told the full stories of the games, with added in content for context on the matter at hand. There were even two separate series for Shadow Dragon at the time. But with the inclusion of manga, of course, came anime. Created in 1996, this OVA, coming out with only two pilot episodes, would tell the story of the original Fire Emblem all over again. 
but with added flashbacks to flesh out Marth's origin story even more. Oddly enough, with literally no word of mouth and an international release of Fire Emblem not even considered yet, these short few episodes made their way over to America exposing an entirely untapped audience to the series. Something even stranger than this was Fire Emblem's first and most bizarre spin-off title, B.S. Fire Emblem, or Fire Emblem Akanea Saga, releasing in 1997 for the equally baffling Satellaview, which was an add-on for the Super Famicom. This complex little device allowed the Super Famicom to receive satellite signals from the Wow Wow station in Tokyo, and with a monthly subscription fee, you would be allowed to download new games right to your console. Fire Emblem Akanea Saga took advantage of these by giving players four new maps to choose from, taking place in between the events of Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon, players were given even more Fire Emblem content than they could ask for. This was only to satiate the crowd's hunger for a new mainlined Fire Emblem title, however. That would come soon enough, but the creator of Fire Emblem, Shozo Kaga, wanted to try something different for the next entry. He wanted to break away from the Arcanian setting to something new with the series, similar yet contrasting with Gaiden. One of Kaga's primary aims while crafting the scenario for the project was to produce a sweeping historical epic where the world undergoes great change over periods of time. Kaga wished to convey how many historical events and behaviors are unpalatable by modern modern standards as a key theme, and to a lesser extent how people's mistakes ended up changing the world. In this, he was determined not to whitewash history, and sought to present a medieval drama reflective of the true nature of the era, and to present both the heroes and the villains of fighting for their own justice, to emphasize the dangers posed by branding a conflict a holy war on either side. This holy war turned out to be the name too. Fire Emblem, Seisen no Kefu, or Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War, releasing in 1997 was by far the most innovative Fire Emblem title in history. Taking the sweeping historical epic to heart, the game's story, while originally meant to be split into three parts, was made into two chapters. Genealogy of the Holy War is set on Jugdral a land whose rulers bear the holy bloodlines of the Twelve Crusaders. The game is split up into two halves, each separated by the time span of a generation. In the first generation, while most of his nation's army is off to war in the eastern nation of Isak, Lord Sigurd defends the duchies of Granvale from a sudden invasion by the neighboring kingdom of Verdain, but is rapidly embroiled in a conspiracy against his father, Vylon in the events which ultimately lead to the birth of the Grand Vale Empire, and in the machinations of the Lopterians to create a human vessel for their Dark Lord, Lopter. The same tyranny fought by his son, Silef, 17 years later in the second generation. This was the key to Genealogy's story. In the first generation, each of the units, save a few, is able to pair off with each other to have children that would go on to be the protagonists of the second generation. Being able to pair off each unit also factors into the child's abilities. Depending on the father, different combinations yield different results. Above all, you had to make sure each character survived until the end, otherwise a substitute character would replace their offspring. The idea of lineages and offspring changed how you played Fire Emblem ever so slightly. One of the core tenets of genealogy was the legacy of the Twelve Crusaders, famous fighters from a time gone by. These people, of course, have their own descendants with the ability to wield a holy weapon associated with them. Coming in two forms, minor and major blood, both offered significant stat boosts to a character. Gameplay was at the forefront of all of this, and Shozo Kaga did much to relate this with the scenario he had planned. Genealogy's maps were made into huge, sprawling affairs in an attempt to change the impression delivered by prior games that the conflict was being fought on a small scale. Instead, it emphasized the game's events as a massive, world-changing conflict. And while the maps became bigger and better, the combat system also improved along the way. Genealogy introduced skills into the mix, abilities processed by units that could change the course of a battle. You could even pass them down to the children, adding further customizability. Weapons had a general durability of 50 uses. After this, they break. However, while in other Fire Emblem games you would never be able to use them again, this time around you can repair them, 
for a fee. This fee, and, well, money in general, is unique to each unit, in a bid to force players to balance out their characters. Everyone earned their own keep. Weapons were also a rarity. And without maintaining and trading them around like this, you could run out of them. Last but not least, the weapon triangle system completely revolutionized and changed how you played. A rock-paper-scissors mechanic. It consisted of two triangles, one for physical attacks and one for magical attacks. Swords beat axes, axes beat lances, lances beat swords. You always had to pair up the right weapon with the right opponent. Otherwise, you could suffer disastrous results. Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War was, and still is according to many, the greatest Fire Emblem title ever made. Its gameplay innovations with the weapon triangle system, skills, and much more, along with the sweeping historical drama scenario that Kaga had made, formed together a quite formidable entry. To improve on this seemed like an impossibility, to say the least. But Kaga and his team would try their very best. Their answer would come not two years after Genealogy's release, Fire Emblem Thracia 776. Releasing originally in 1999 through Nintendo Power and later in 2000 as a formal cartridge, this entry would take advice from Gaiden and tell its own side story. Featuring Leaf, one of the many possible children, Thracia 776 takes place between chapters 5 and 6 of Genealogy. And we won't say anything else because it would spoil the story of Genealogy, but we do recommend playing it. Anyway, back to the topic at hand, where Thracia innovated the most was, like genealogy, its gameplay. While skills and the weapon triangle remained, Thracia added weapon ranks. Previously introduced in genealogy as static and based on a class, Thracia implemented the version that would become the mainstay of the series. Ranks that increase through newfound weapons and by weapons gaining their own separate experience. The game also introduced a couple other systems, Rescue, Capture, and Fog of War. It allowed higher ranked units to rescue others from harm, or have them leave the battle entirely at the cost of some penalties to their stats. Exclusive to Thracia and a more recent Fire Emblem venture is the Capture Mechanic, an offensive version of rescuing in which units can overpower and seize enemies rather than killing them outright. You could then steal their weapons, let them go, or simply hold on to them to possibly recruit some extra units. Another mainstay mechanic became the Fog of War, a weather state that hinders your visibility of the battlefield. When it is in full effect, allied units have a limited range of vision and can't see anything outside of it, creating a sense of uncertainty and caution, as enemies are invisible until they walk right into your path. Fatigue also contributed to this sense of caution you required. Every time a unit performs an action, they gain fatigue. Use them too much and they won't be available for the next chapter. Speaking of chapters, there were concepts for those too. Gaiden chapters were side stories that you could only get after fulfilling certain conditions, and escape chapters forced you to flee while fighting for your lives. These helped along what Thracia 776 would be famous for. Hailed by many as the most difficult Fire Emblem ever created, the game would show you no no mercy whatsoever. Enemies and their tactics were brutal in execution, forcing you to carefully plan out each of your moves and have your tactics at near perfection. Some other difficulty raisers include some of the most intricately crafted maps in franchise history, dismounting proving to be a hindrance rather than being helpful, and the game flat out not telling you anything. In the end, this was a game meant for the fans. Combined with a release far exceeding the lifetime of the console, alluded to the fact that this would not sell that well at all. In fact, it may just be the worst selling entry in the franchise, period. It may have even led to the departure of Shozo Kaga, who had guided the hand of the series from the very beginning. It all started with the release of the Nintendo 64. Back when everyone was getting hyped up for this new console, and Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War had just released, fans were clamoring for an entry on Nintendo's shiny new console. Kaga would deny the claim, wishing to continue on with the Super Famicom system and return to Akania with the higher level of strategy in tow. However, not a year later, Shigeru Miyamoto would announce that a game would release on the console in 1998. The following year, Kaga revealed that his plans for a proper return to Akania had fallen through. If it had properly been released, Fire Emblem 64 would have been renamed 
Fire Emblem Ankoku no Miko, or Fire Emblem Maiden of Darkness for the now-failed Nintendo 64 DD. His plans falling through, among many other unknown reasons, would force Kaga to leave his beloved franchise behind forever. He would then form his own company, Turninug, and create his own true successor to Fire Emblem, Emblem Saga. But with its creator gone and a AAA status at risk, the future looked grim for the Fire Emblem series, and Shouzo Kaga wasn't out of this mess yet. Hello, dear viewer, and thank you for watching another episode of Chronicles. If you enjoyed hearing about the origins of Fire Emblem, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for something new every week. But who am I? Well, I'm Loxton, the main voice of Chronicles of Gaming. If you want to learn more about gaming with theories and reviews alike, then check out my channel here for more. So what is your opinion on Shouzo Kaga leaving the Fire Emblem series? Do you think the franchise is better off without him, or ruined because of his absence? Chris and I would love to hear what you have to say in the comments down below. And don't forget to check out our website, where you can read scripts for the latest episodes a week early. Anyway, that's it from us. Don't forget to stay awesome, and continue that thirst for knowledge.